Good morning. How are y'all today? I think our Methodist leaning folks stayed home today because it was sprinkling. But we Baptists, we like to be dumped, don't we? So we don't mind getting wet. No truth to that at all. It didn't mess my hair up, so I don't mind. We're so glad to see you here this morning. It's good to be back. I missed y'all last week, but I have heard so many good things about Brother Ira. I don't even know where he's at right now. I know I saw him. Oh, he's hidden back there. Brother, I want to thank you for that. It's good to know that we have a, a couple few that will step in when the need arises. So praise the Lord. Amen. And we don't have to go outside of our body to get who knows what in the pulpit. So I'm very thankful for that to have a chance to get away. Good to be back. I hope you're here this morning prepared and ready to worship. Amen. Well, let's begin that with some singing. Brother, if you would, come on. Oh, how marvelous and how wonderful it is, God's love for us. Why does he do that? I don't know, because he's God, and we're not. You'll find a couple of courses there on your bulletin. You may not need to look at it at all, and so don't bother. Uh, we're going to stand together and sing, starting with how marvelous is God's love for us. Can we stand as we sing, please? From the heart now. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Father, the love that you have for us is indeed marvelous and wonderful and amazing. We know that it's a love that has lifted us from the depths and lifted us from the darkness and given us a special new life both here and in the next life as well. Accept our praise, Father, as we sing about that wonderful love just now in Jesus' name. Amen. Just remain standing to sing, Love Lifted Me. You know this. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. My soul's best song, faithful loving service to to him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love. Nothing. 
completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me. seated, please. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to be reading from Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. The, um, it's about Thanksgiving. I think with the country the way it is right now, I think we all need to count our blessings. Even though things may be a little crazy in the world, God was always in control. And we need to remember that. And so this is what my verses are. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Turn to your hymnals again with me. Just remain seated. This time, let's sing hymn number 227. Praise him, praise him. Sing it like you mean it. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, sing over His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children in his arms. He carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him. Tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him. Ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, for our sins he suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation, hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the Unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him. Tell of his excellence.
excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Sandra, would you ask God a blessing on our offering? this morning it is well with my soul no matter where you are on the spectrum of happiness right now I hope you can say that it is well with your soul amen well we're staring down the barrel of Veterans Day and before I begin I'd like to ask how many in here are veterans if you would please stand because we'd like to say thank you for your service all right we got two three all right amen fellas amen thank you Thank you. You know where this country would be if we didn't have veterans willing to go and keep liberty and freedom alive. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we want to thank you for that, and I hope you have a good Veterans Day. I see. We need to get a strobe light or a disco ball, don't we, Joey? Is that better? All right. Yeah. I'm glad I was near that mic. I don't know if it was on or not. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to, um, let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to be, I don't know, a little bit all over the place. Y'all ready for that? I'm going to tell you everything I know. Did you bring your lunch? Right. We should be out of here in five minutes if I tell you everything that I know. So we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at Abraham. I've got a class that I'm teaching on Tuesdays, and, and we're going through the life of Abraham. So in the, the previous class, we look through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, the creation and those accounts all the way up through Tower of Bible and things like that. 
And now in, in Genesis chapter 12 through 25, we're looking at the life of Abraham more basically. So we start to lock in on this great patriarch, Abraham. And we all know a lot about Abraham, but Abraham was a man of flaws. Abraham was a man of faith, but he was also a man of doubt at times. Can anybody identify? And so I think I titled this sermon, if it's, it's in there, Who Are You? Who are you? Now, I'm not talking about um, the identities that, that, you know, everybody wants to focus on today. I want to know if you know who you are in Christ Jesus. See, Abraham had some wonderful promises. In, in Genesis chapter 12, I'll read that. You don't have to turn if, unless you don't trust me. Then you can look at it too. But in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless him. And him that dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How many of you see that as an overarching promise that God gave Abraham? Isn't that a phenomenal thing? Wouldn't you love for the Lord to speak to you in whatever way he spoke to Abraham in that day? I think it's somewhat maybe different than today because we do have God's Word contained in Scriptures and, and we have these things written down that God had said in the past. And so we can refer to God's Word. We can see the promises. We can see the blessings. We can see the curses. We can see the activities. Paul tells us in the, in the New Testament that all the things in the Old Testament were written down for our benefit, so that we can see how they did it, what they got right and what they got wrong, and we can adjust our path accordingly. Amen? Sometimes we don't do that, though, do we? I just think it's a fabulous thing. Wouldn't you love to have that promise that Abraham had, that thing that God gave him, that he said that he's going to bless all the nations, all the peoples of the world through him? Well, we can look back through gospel eyes, and we can see that that is Jesus Christ, who is of the genealogy of Abraham. Amen? Abraham is the first Hebrew. So when it comes down to it, he's the beginning of this line that God called out. He called him from a pagan nation. He called him from pagan gods, separated him out. And he said, listen, I want you to get away from your country because it's going to be hard to grow and serve the Lord in that country. He said, I want you to get away from your father's house because you're going to have to get away from the people that are close to you so that I can work with you independently. And then he said, and I want you to go to a place that somebody else is already living in, and I'm going to give it to you. Now, they're still fighting about that today, aren't they? But that's what he said. He said, and several other promises he gave Abraham as you look through these next chapters. And so he, he promised him this great thing. And Abraham, we know from looking further on, believe God. And it was accounted unto him as righteousness. And that's so important that that's in the Bible because in the New Testament it's, it's quoted a couple more times. It was accounted to him as righteousness. What was? His faith. Not his circumcision. That didn't happen yet. Not, not, not any of the law. The, the law hadn't been given yet. Not, not any of these other things. What was accredited to Abraham as righteousness is that he believed God and he acted according to his belief. And that's a big deal, isn't it? That is faith in action. That's doing according to what you believe. Now, a lot of people can say they believe this or believe that, but they don't always live according to what they say they believe, right? How many times have you heard it said, Preacher, live me a sermon, don't preach me one? Well, maybe they don't tell you, Preacher, but they tell me that. You know, live me a sermon versus tell me one. If, if it doesn't make a difference in your life, can you really say that you truly believe it? Well, now we all struggle with faith sometimes, don't we? Sometimes we struggle with doubt. Sometimes we struggle with misguidedness in our life. Sometimes we have things that are happening in our world or in our life that we just don't understand, and, and we can get a little bit flustered, we can get a little bit frustrated, we can get a little bit beside ourselves, and, and those kind of things kind of happen. Sometimes people are having the worst week of their life, and other people are celebrating. So, I mean, that's kind of what we're living through in this country right now. We're pretty well split right down the middle on what we think we want. But, you know, God's still on the throne. That's all the politics I have for today. That's not the end of the sermon, though. So if you'll jump over to Genesis chapter 15, I want you to see something that while we were studying this a couple weeks ago, and I told the class, I said, I got a sermon out of that. I won't tell you what it is because I want to preach it. Um, and that way you won't know ahead of time. I don't know. I like ser sermons to be surprises. So in Genesis chapter 15, all these things had been happening. He went and he, he, he separated from Lot, and then God spoke to him again. So... 
He, he did. He, he went to one place, his dad died, then he moved on with Lot. And when he got down the road with Lot, they got so big, they were fussing with one another. He said, listen, Lot, you go one way, I'll go the other. You pick what you want. And Lot, Lot said, hey, give me the bright lights, big city. So that's what he did. He moved towards the bright lights in the big city. And Abraham said, you know, you choose the mountain, I'll choose the plain. You choose the plain, I'll choose the mountains. We'll just separate so that we're, we're kin. We don't need to fight. And so they did. They separated. And as soon as they separated, then God appeared to Abraham again and spoke to him again and said, listen. Now, it wasn't Abraham yet. He's still calling him Abram. Abram means father of many. And God being as funny as he is about these things, later on, not by chapter 15, but a little bit later on, changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Now, Abraham means uh, father of nations. So it's, it's kind of like, well, wait, wait a minute here. Um, and if you don't know the backstory of Abraham and Sarah, they don't have any kids. She couldn't bear children. But God promised to make a great nation out of them. And, and he, he took him outside. God took him outside and, and said, listen, see if you can count the stars. Because if you can count the stars, you'll have an idea about how many children you're going to have. What your offspring's going to be like. And Abraham's thinking, I don't even have one. <laughs> and God ups the ante. He said, tell you what, if you could count the sands of the desert. That's how many offspring you're going to have. Now, we know that jumping forward into the New Testament, we know that everybody who is a child of God through faith, which is the only way to become a child of God, it's not genealogy, it's not what church you go to, it's not what kind of car or Bible you carry, it's, it's having trust, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. No man comes unto the Father but by me, Jesus said. And we know that everybody that walks in faith like that walks in the faith that Abraham had. So we're considered sons of Abraham. A lot of you probably, I don't know if you went to Bible camp like I did, but I went to Bible camp. I guess I was just steeped in it from, from when I was young. And we'd sing that song, Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. Right? Y'all know that song? Well, a lot of it has to do with the faith, not the, not the genetics, right? Because we can also see that the, a lot of the people that are in the land today that will call themselves Hebrew aren't necessarily people of faith. They're not following God and walking after God, even right now presently as we speak. They don't have faith that Jesus was who he claimed to be. But yet we are children that way. John tells us that we have the power to become the sons. Let me rephrase that. The children of of God even to those that believe on his name remember Jesus said if you can't believe me because of what I say believe me because of the very works that I do he was doing things that nobody could do that weren't God he was forgiving sins which really messed with the Pharisees they wanted to kill him over that multiple times he was healing people he was raising people from the dead that's pretty unique amen he was given sight to the blind. Never occurred in history. But he could do it. He had control of the wind. He could walk on water. Everything he displayed said there's something different, something unique about him. And he told the Pharisees, if you can't believe me for what I say, believe me by what you see. You can't deny it, and you can't fake it. You either have the authority, and therefore the power, or you don't. <clears throat> so this is the story kind of going forward. Abraham is the father of many nations. Now, let's, let's make him human a little bit, okay? Abraham was a liar. There was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down into Egypt. Now, we don't see where God said, Abraham wants you to go down into Egypt. That's interesting. Everywhere that Abraham moved, he built an altar. He would build an altar and he'd worship God. He'd go to this place, he'd build an altar, he'd worship God. He went to the Oaks of Mamre, he'd build an altar, he'd worship God. He went into Egypt, he did not. Egypt is also a picture of the world. And a lot of times when we get off in the world, we're not building altars, are we? Abraham went down there and Sarah was evidently a looker. Now, I don't know what that looked like in that day. But evidently, she was a looker. And Abraham knew that he had married up out of his class. And he knew that Pharaoh, they thought, was a god in Egypt. He knew if he went down there that Pharaoh was going to see Sarah and say, Mm-hmm, she's fetching. Fetch her for me. So you know what Abraham told Sarah to do? When we get there, say that you're my sister. Because they find out you're my wife, they'll take you from me and they'll kill me. And you don't want me to die, do you, sweetheart? 
And she said, no, I'll lie for you. Again, he did that twice, by the way. But when they went down into Egypt, that's what he told her to say. Now, she was a half-sister. Now, I know that's freaking some of you out. But remember, we don't have the law yet that says don't marry your sister. The law didn't come till later. But she was a half-sister. You know, she was a sister from another mister kind of thing. They go down there. She says, I'm his sister. And Pharaoh says, mm-hmm. She's fetching. Fetch her for me. Well, God had to um, enlighten Pharaoh that the guy he was messing with, the girl he was messing with, that that guy was actually her husband. And God frowned upon that. Still does today, by the way. Don't mess with another man's wife. God frowned on that. And then the Pharaoh said, what have you done to me? Why would you lie to me this way? Haven't we blessed you while you were here? And so what he does is he gives Abraham lots of stuff. Because I think he had a real fear for God. He, he gave him lots of stuff, and he sent him away. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get out of here. I, I don't want your kind living here. Well, the, the famine had died down now. So Abraham takes all this extra stuff that they were given. Hagar probably being one of them, but that's another sermon for another day. And they head out of there. So she goes from Pharaoh's harem, but God had protected her. I mean, that's, that's Abraham. Does that sound like a normal guy to y'all? Yeah. Ab Abraham was an, Ab Abram was a normal guy. Later on, we know about Hagar. And I've talked to you about this before. And Sarah says, you know, we're not having any kids. We're going to do it our way. Why don't you go into my handmaid? Abraham said, whatever you say. Matter of fact, the Bible says he obeyed the word of Sarah. And we're still dealing with the mess today. Right? Still dealing with the mess. The Old Testament is full of that mess. Sound like a normal guy? Y'all were less vocal on that one. Does that sound like a normal wife? No way, right? So she's a, she's a different bird herself. So, so these are people. They have feet of clay. They, they, they make mistakes. They can, I love Peter. Peter could say the most profound thing that Jesus would say, Peter, from your lips, wow. There's no way you could know that, but the Spirit of God told you that. And Peter would say, that's exactly right. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cuts the guy's ear off trying to defend Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, put the sword up. That's not what we're about. Peter could open his mouth and insert his foot on a regular basis. People with feet of clay. They sound very familiar, don't they? I think sometimes when we think about the patriarchs, and we, we think about the men that God used and, and the women that God used, we always think, you know, they probably walked three inches off the ground, didn't move their legs, they just floated. Maybe with some sort of weird hand gesture, because if you look at some of the, the, the iconography, the, the, you know, they got their hands in some kind of weird pose. <laughs> just, and we think they kind of just glided around and, and glistened a little bit because the Spirit of God was on them. That's not the case at all, is it? People with the Spirit of God on them are people that have the Spirit of God in them. Amen? And, and, and when we're obedient to God, we see God working in our life. When we're disobedient to God, we see God kind of cornering us off and saying, I need to talk to you, child. Right? So here's Abraham. That promise in chapter 12 is astounding. Now, I don't know if that would have been enough for you. It wasn't enough for Abraham. He thanked God. He saw God's hand. He went against the five armies down there around Sodom and Gomorrah. He fought against them. He won with 318 trained men in his camp. Abraham was tough. He went down there and met Melchizedek. Now, that's a story in itself. And he offered tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek offered him wine and bread. That's a picture of something. I don't know what, maybe, but it's a picture of something, isn't it? Abraham had an astounding life. God was moving. God called him. God appeared to him physically. Abraham had conversations with him. We know a little bit later on, chapters past this, that Abraham's chilling in the, under the tent flap on a hot day, and three men show up. Two of them are angels, and one of them is the angel of the Lord, which is God incarnate. And you're like, what? How'd God do that? Nobody's ever looked at God and lived. Well, I think it was Jesus before he was Jesus. I don't have a problem with that. 
that may mess with some of y'all's minds. That's pretty lucky, though, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you love that? Have you ever been in a place where you don't know what to do? Have you ever been confused about what decision you should make next? And you're like, if God would just show up and... Could you imagine hearing that? And you're like, wait a minute, how's somebody knocking on my door? The ring doorbell didn't go off. Because the ring doorbell can't pick up God, amen? But you hear, you go open the door, and there's this being standing there. That you know there's something different. And of course, in a God voice, he says, Rusty, you've been messing up. Or, I'm going to bless you beyond measure. And I'm like, cool, come in, sit down. Which he did with Abraham, right? That's what happened with Abraham. Wouldn't that be awesome? And it's a, let me ask you a question or two. What do you think about, or what should I do with? But could you imagine that happening? Well, that, that's Abraham. He had these phenomenal things happen in his life that we don't see duplicated in time. Moses met God in a burning bush, the burning bush that was never consumed. What did God say to Moses? Take your shoes off where you stand the holy ground. Right? Wouldn't it be awesome? But you know there's only one burning bush in Scripture. Just one. There's only one, three beings appearing to a man in his tent. Only one time with Abraham. See, God doesn't often duplicate things. So when God is moving and God is talking and it's a unique thing, it should stop us. We should be amazed. But you know, we're, we're people. We can grow dull really quick. We can get just a little bit off center with things that are going on and or we can forget about God's promises or we forget about God's blessings or he's brought you this far, right? But then, well, things are just going tough right now. Sometimes I think God is silent. Somebody, I was talking to somebody not long ago and they said that, you know, that somebody was mad at God. And I said, well, you have to believe in him to be mad at him, right? But we get a little bit, sometimes we look around and, Car won't run right. Y'all ever get down the dumps over things like that? Car won't. My truck blew up. Y'all know that. Blew, locked the motor up in. It's still sitting inside the house. Everybody said, what are you going to do with it? I don't know. Haven't had a chance to think about it. I don't know what I'm going to do. So we're down a vehicle. Haven't missed anything. Down a vehicle. Our dishwasher, and when I say that, I don't mean Susan. She is not the dishwasher. <laughs> but our dishwasher just occasionally won't wash nothing. Take them out and they look as dirty as you put them in. And I got under it and took it apart, took the pump off of it, and found some crud in the pump, fixed the pump, put it back on because you can't just buy the pump. You got to buy that whole piece and it's like $300. Well, at that point, you might as well get one, right? Well, I want to get one. <laughs> Getting a So, and I, I'm not telling you all I need a dishwasher. Don't go out and buy me a dishwasher. Well, unless you feel led to then, of course. <laughs> yeah. Last night, we emptied the dishwasher. I, I thought I'd fixed it. Dishes were dirty. Needed, a bunch of them need to be run again. So, okay. About six months ago, our ice dispenser quit on the fridge. Well, I can fix it with a motherboard. $350 motherboard. Well, at this point, I might as well pay $800 more and get another fridge. Because you just don't have enough hot water. Okay, so I've got a water heater that's on the blank. I might have to put new elements in it. And it's no big deal. I'm put elements in it. That's nothing to me but things can kind of add up, can't they? And you start thinking, I, I could do one of those things. I can't do all of those things. And we can get a little bit focused right here, right now. And I think sometimes we do that, and I'm not there. Those are just illustrations that came to mind while I was standing here. That wasn't my plan. They're just the good illustrations, and they're about me. I'm not picking on you. But you can just get a little bit overwhelmed sometimes, can't you? Where's God? I think sometimes we forget to count our blessings. But more than that, I think sometimes we forget who we are. Now, that's the introduction. I'm sorry. This should be quick, though. Should be. Let's see what happens. Verse, chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Wow. Wouldn't you like God to appear and tell you that? He appeared and spoke to him and he says, listen, listen, this is going to be awesome. Fear not, because I imagine you would be afraid. Fear not, Abram, 
I am your shield. What is that? A shield is a protector, right? I got you. The way we'd put it in modern vernacular. I've got you. Don't, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Well, that sounds good. How many of you like a reward? Yeah, Abraham, Abraham did too. How does Abraham answer? I'll pick it up in a minute. I'll pick it up in a minute too. How does Abraham answer when God shows up again? He's already, he's done it more to Abram than I bet he has you. Here he is again. Now, Abram's a keystone to a lot of things, so we understand that. But he shows up, and Abram said, or it starts, but Abram said, Oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. You reckon he forgot the first promise? Well, the first promise was what? He was going to make a great nation of him, right? And in the meantime, they've talked about count the stars of the sky. In the meantime, they talk about counting the sands of the earth. And he says, listen, if you can do all this, this is going to be your offspring. And, and Abram means father of many. So even his name is a lie in Abram's mind. Now, I don't know that Sarah was nagging a little bit about, you know, that God keeps promising all this. What has he done for us lately? I don't know that that was involved at all, but I know the words out of Abram's own mouth, especially when the scripture says, but Abram said. Can you imagine God shows up? I got good news for you. I'm your shield. I'm your protector. This is going to be awesome. And Abram says, I don't know. What can you possibly do for me? I don't even have a kid. And the dude that's going to get everything that I own, it's not even of my house. He's from Damascus. Sounds very human at this point, doesn't he? Sounds very possible that that could be one of us. Probably on many occasions. Thought you loved me, God. How can God love me when I'm going through this, right? And we, we kind of get that way. And I think Abram forgot who he is. You can go back to chapter 12, and here he is living over in this area that's full of pagan idols. Now, this isn't far after the flood. They knew who God was. Everybody knows the flood story back then, and everybody knew who did it. But they'd already gotten where they were worshiping all these different deities, and Abram was right up in the mix. Ur of the Chaldees is a place full of polytheism, all kinds of gods. Just throw another one in. It didn't matter. And then the God, the creator God that, that brought the flood, that saved Noah, that, was, that created Adam and Eve, everybody knew the story then. That God calls Abram and says, listen, I need you to get up out of this mess and go to a different place. Get away from your family. Get away from your father's house into a land that somebody else is living there, but I'm going to take care of that. And Abram, he was told all that. Then he, God comes back and says, I'm your shield, buddy. I got you. You know those five armies you just whooped with 318 men? That was me, right? I mean, that's, that's the picture I'm getting. If you read the chapters together, you can see that God's done some marvelous things with Abraham. But Abram says, oh, I don't know if you're going to be able to do it. I mean, things are kind of tough right now inside the tent. We're in our late 70s. Well, Sarah is. He's in his 80s. We don't have any kids yet. I don't know how you're going to do all these things you promised. Because the way I see it, it's impossible. Now, you may not realize that, but that's what Abram was thinking. God wasn't quite ready yet. And you know the story. God waited till he was about 100. Because nobody doubts God's involved at that age. She's 90, he's 100. She's expecting. Now, I don't know if you've been around many 100-year-old women. But if anybody's going to live to be 100, most of the time it is the women, right? Next time you're around one, ask them, how'd you like to be pregnant? <laughs> Can you imagine? That's a miracle of God. And, and, but God was waiting for his timing, right? Because in his timing, God gets the glory. You get the benefit because you walked in faith and you trusted him. And here he is. He's still 10 years out or more. This isn't nowhere near happening. God said, this is going to be awesome. When people see Sarah is expecting, whoo, 
It's going to be earth-shattering news to everybody. And Abraham's like, well, I don't know, maybe. Very human, right? He's forgot who he is. He's forgotten the promises. He's forgotten the blessings. He's forgotten the miracles. He's forgotten that God's not talking to very many people at this point. But he's talking to Abram. On a regular basis, they're like buddies. God just shows up, shows up several more times. And Abram says, I, I just don't know. I continue childless there. My house is Eleazar. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring. And remember, my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Can you imagine? I, I added the emphasis because I think that's kind of what it was like. Maybe even louder and deeper. Abram. Hush, this man's not going to be your, what did I tell you? Right? Abram's over here all mealy mouth. This man's not going to be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. This is when he brought him out and said, take a look. Do you, count the stars. These are going to be yours. And I'm going to come back. It's going to be a while. Still. He didn't tell him that. Wouldn't you like to have God's timetable? I think one of the biggest problems that Abram faced is a problem that a lot of us face is we forget who we are. We forget all the things that God says about us. We get looking at our situation and we get lost. I don't have this and I don't have that. One of my favorite books, and you all know because I spent a few years teaching through it in several different places, is Ephesians. Now, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to because we covered it in depth. But Ephesians chapter 1 makes an interesting statement. Paul starts off teaching. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus. You know what saint means? Holy one. It's the Greek word hagios, which means holy, unique, different. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do three things, have miracles and all those things to be a saint. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a holy one of God. Amen? Sometimes we forget that, though, don't we? We are the holy ones of God. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God and the Father our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. So what's it take to be a, a Christian? A believer in Christ, right? Once you believe in Christ, you're placed into Christ. Not just that God moves into you, yes, but you're placed into him. Listen to what it goes on and says. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So, there's so much contained in those seven verses about who we are in Christ. I went through the Bible and, and looked up a couple things. Who are we? Who are you in Christ? First thing I think is important is we're forgiven. You're forgiven. Not on a day-by-day -day basis. He died on the cross 2,000 years for you. He paid for all of your sins. And the moment you come to him in faith and in belief, he forgives you of all of your sins, the ones you haven't even committed yet because he knows. So when you stand before God, how do you stand before him? Forgiven. Forgiven. How many of us forget that? And we come to God a little bit groveling, we come to him and, you know, I'm just a poor old wretched sinner. Boy, that makes good country singing, though, don't it? I love the country song that says the old man is gone, though. The old man is dead. The new man is what lives on. How many of us forget that? We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. How do we live? Moment to moment. Failure to failure. Sin to sin. Toughness to toughness. And we can kind of get focused on the tough things in life, can't we? And then our mess just grows instead of our mess becoming our message. Because if God brings you to something, God's going to lead you through something. And the things that you learn in the midst of that process make you who you are on the other side. But I think sometimes we forget 
Like Abraham forgot how many things God had promised him. He'd forgotten how many times he's met with God personally. We don't have record of God doing that with other people at the same time. So first, of all, first and foremost, who are you? You're forgiven in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're forgiven. Isn't it nice to be forgiven? You ever done something to somebody and they won't forgive you? They just won't forgive you. Yeah, God's not like that. You come to God, God forgives you. We're chosen. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 says, We know now, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. We talked about the people of Abraham. And then Paul says in Thessalonians that God chose you to be his people. We are his people. You are the people of God, and you were chosen to be so. Isn't that a great thing? Everybody likes to be chosen, don't they? You ever gone out for, to play sports, schoolyards, or, or empty lot sports, and nobody wanted you on their team? That was always me. Nobody wanted me on their team. I was always that chubby kid that had cowboy boots on. They knew I couldn't play whatever they were playing. It's nice to be picked. It's nice to be chosen. To be the one. That God chose. Amen. So who are you? If you're a child of God, you're chosen. You are chosen. A couple other things that I wrote down. We're a friend. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples. I no longer call you slaves. Because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friend. Since I've told you everything the Father has told me. And we have it written right here, don't we? So we're friends of God. Isn't that cool? Anyone in here got a good friend? I mean, a good friend. How many good friends do you have, though? Can you count them on one hand? Usually. Go all the way through life. You've had a lot of people that you run around with, a lot of people you had a lot of fun with. You had a lot of people that you enjoyed their company, but they really weren't the kind of friend that knew the worst about you but was your friend anyway. That's a friend, right? They know all the bad stuff. They were there with you when you did it. But they're always there. You know what kind of friend I like? I like a friend that 10 years could go in between and you get a phone call or, or a Facebook and take right back off where you left off. You don't get all that, where you been? I've needed you. you, don't, you don't, you're just like, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Just like, boom. Susan's got a few good friends like that. I've got a couple good friends like that. Just because you're friends, you just keep on going. We're the friend of God. That's special, isn't it? To be the friend of God. Not only that, we're healed. He personally carried our sins on his body to the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live by what is right. His wounds, we are healed. That's First Peter. And the last one that I want to mention is we're adopted. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. This is a different translation than what I read you earlier. But this is Ephesians 1, 5. God decided in advance to adopt us as his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ, being in Jesus. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. I have no idea what translation that is, but I like the way it's worded. We are adopted. I know some people in this room can speak to that, what it means to be adopted. That kind of goes back to being chosen, doesn't it? It's a special thing to be adopted. And then the goes, Bible goes on and says that we who were once dead in sin are alive. You're alive. If we get our focus on the things going on in our life, we can get a little bit down. We begin to forget who we are in Christ. So then our emotions begin to rule our life rather than the truth that's in God. We get carried away by, by a sense of defeat or a sense of failure. We just, we get under it because this is happening and that is happening. And You ever had things just like I was talking about with my appliances stack up on you? It's just like, okay, I can, I can fix the ice maker, but we'll do it later. Well, the, then the ice maker says, that, and of course the house is 17 years old, everything's bought at the same time. It's time, right? The dishwasher says, I'm out of here. Nope, I'm back. No, I'm out of here. Nope, I'm going to work today. 
And you could look at that and look at that and, and look at the other thing and, and the repairs that need to be done, the bills that have to be paid, and Christmas is almost here. Can you believe that? And you really get under what's going on and forget about who you are. And, and if we don't take ownership of who we are in Christ, if we don't identify as some of these terms that I brought you today, I, somebody else was preaching, I was listening, and I was trying to jot these things down. Who we are, we are redeemed. We are justified. We are adopted. We are a precious possession to God. We're that unique thing, peculiar possession to God. We're chosen. We are children of God. We are qualified, and we are gifted. Gifted. Every single one of you that's a believer has been gifted by God to perform marvelous things in his kingdom right here on this earth in his church gifted by god and we can think well you know there's nothing special about me god says you're very special well you know i i'm not very famous god is infamous and you're his child you're royal and the bible also says that we're priests you know a priest is the one that can go before god the whole lost and dying world that's celebrated through music and, and movies and television and things like that, we can go before God. We can just cry out, Abba, Father. You're familiar with that in Galatians, right? Where Paul says we, we cry out, Abba. See, that's, the, that's a way of saying Daddy. And when Christ came, he was the first one that did that. He talked about his personal father in an Abba kind of way, in a Daddy kind of way. My Father sent me. Nothing that I do, I do on my own, but what my father, my daddy, told me to do. You ever heard of people that were told when they were leaving the house, don't forget who you are? Don't forget who you are. Now, mine never told me that because I'm a Fitzpatrick and we don't announce that. Don't let them know you're a Fitzpatrick, right? Because that, that name doesn't necessarily carry all that much weight, so there's no sense advertising that name. Some of y'all were told, don't forget who you are. You're a Johnson. Don't forget who you are. You're a this or you're a that. Don't forget you represent us. You're constantly reminded. Well, this sermon is a reminder. Don't forget who you are. You're a child of the king. You've been anointed. You've been blessed. You've been forgiven. You are part of a royal priesthood by being a child of the king. You know who you're not? You're not your sins. You are not your failures. You know how many people live with their failures over them like a dark cloud? There's so many people that walk in, in, a, in a state of depression and because all they can think about is the sins. So here's the thing. When Jesus died on the cross, he knew your sins. He knew you intimately. And he says, yep, I'll die for resting. And his royal blood was applied to me. And God's forgiveness was granted me through my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, get up. You're my son. Get up. You're a child of the king. You're not your sins. You're not your failures. You're not your mistakes. You're not what other people think of you. I got news for you, by the way. If you're in here today and you're one of those that's bothered by what other people think of you, you need to understand one thing. It's none of your business what anybody else thinks of you. It is none of your business what other people think of you. We can't get past that. We get caught up in, well, so-and-so was talking bad about me. Was it the truth or a lie? Then don't let it get on you. If it's the truth, get right. But if it's a lie... Don't worry about people lie. Haters going to hate, right? That's a modern pop song for y'all. Don't know. Haters going to hate. That's what they do, right? And if you're successful, if, you're, if God's blessing you, don't you think people hated Abraham? Everything Abraham touched turned to gold. He was wealthy nomad. A wealthy nomad. You know what nomad means? No home. Lived in tents. Floated around with livestock. And they just kept duplicating. They kept getting more, kept getting more. He goes into Egypt. He comes out with more. So much so that when he delivered the five kings, they said, 
You can have all of the stuff. Just give us the people. And Abraham said, not so. I've lifted my hand to God that I won't take a dime from you lest you say you made Abraham rich. Well, it's hard to turn down though, right? He could have went from being a billionaire to a gazillionaire overnight. And he said, I don't want nothing you got because I enjoy God's blessing on my life. And so it's none of your business what people think of you. Just go on. Take it up with God. Take it up with God. Because you know God say, well, they lie all the time anyway. I don't even know them. And that's just Satan in their life. Producing hate. Because they want to knock you down a little bit. I heard a saying years ago, and I'd forgotten about Susan. Reminded me earlier this week about this. Do you know that blowing out somebody else's candle doesn't make yours any brighter? So when somebody's trying to blow out your candle, don't worry about it. They're not going to burn any brighter. But that's what a lot of people think. I'll just blow out all the candles around me. You know, if you want to look sad and hang out with big people, that doesn't work, does it? Don't blow out other people's candles. It's not going to help you any at all. You're not what other people think of you. And you're not what you tell yourself. You know how much garbage thinking we let into our head? Because we begin to believe what the haters say. We, uh, we begin to believe what the press says. And I learned early on in the ministry, I can't listen to the good nor the bad. Because if you, know, if, if you love that sermon, hang around a week, you want the next one. Right? It's, we, we don't accumulate points. And I've come to learn that as a pastor, as a preacher, as a teacher, you're really only as good as your last message. Or you're really only as good as your last success. Because we're tested on a daily basis. Amen? We're either walking with God and serving God and going with God or begin to ebb away and flow away. And we see it all around us. Look, Go around and look at churches. There's a lot of churches that are dwindling and, and going down in number and going down in size. And it's a mix of this and a mix of that. And who do we blame ultimately? We blame the coach when the team starts losing. Don't we? So the pastors get to blame. Now, they're guilty a whole lot of the time. And y'all have met a few, so you know. But you can't believe what you tell yourself about you. Because the Bible says that you are more than conqueror. The Bible says that you've been redeemed. The Bible says that you've been justified. The Bible says that you've been lifted up on high and that you're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. The Bible says that you are a co-heir with Christ. You are part of the royal family. So what should we do? Praise the Lord. Live like it. Don't begin to believe the lies the devil tells you. That's what Ephesians was talking about in the last chapter. The fiery darts of the wicked one. The fiery little javelins he sends into your life to tear you down, to break you down. To keep you from soaring. To mount up on wings as eagles, as Isaiah says. How do we do that? We believe what God has told us. God has said that you are all of these things. You either believe it and live like it, or you're struggling. You're struggling, and it's a terrible place to be. And it's time to confess that sin, which that's what that is. That's a sin. It's time to confess that sin that I've doubted you, Lord, that, that I don't believe what you say about me, Lord, that, that, that I, have, I have problems accepting what you've told me is true about me, Lord. That's what that is. That's doubting what God has said about you. It's time to recognize that, not as just that's who I am, that's my personality trait, but that's a wedge that's been driven between you and that fulfilled life that God wants you to have. And you, you're fulfilled. It doesn't matter the money. It doesn't matter the prestige. It doesn't matter the things that you own. What matters is that you belong to him. And that should guide us every day. Amen? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, today, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that you will take what's been said this morning, that, Father, you would guide it into some sort of semblance and give us understanding of how the things that we need to adjust in our life, and, Father, how that we can surrender that to you, that we can come before you, Father, in your holy throne and say, Lord, help me to live according to the things that you say are true about me. Father, we, we accept that the best way that we know now. Now, Father, help us to step according to that. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray.
Amen. Let's have a time of invitation, brother. What song are we going to sing? 486. So as, as we're in this time of invitation, if you need to do business with God, you need to work something out with him, this is your opportunity. Take care of that. Deal with the things that he has pointed out in your life. Maybe you just need to sit there, you just need to praise him for your blessings. And say, Lord, I thank you for blessing me in all of these ways. This is a great time to take, take care of that because we're going to be here a few more minutes and then we'll leave. Let's stand as we sing.